<laughs> so good afternoon everybody. Welcome to our our seminar here with the with the very dramatic title uh, Stop World War 3 the Middle East is the new Balkans. Uh, and I'll just say, uh, well, I can present myself, I'm Tom Gillisberg, I'm the head of the Copenhagen Office of Executive Intelligence Review, our international journal. I'm also the chairman of the Danish Schiller Institute, and these both institutions are very much associated with the American uh, economist and, and, and statesman Lyndon LaRouche. I'll just say to begin with, now you can see we have a camera, we also have some recording here, but that's only for my introduction here and what I will say, we will record it so those that could not be here today will have access to it. And once I'm through with that, we'll turn it off so there can be informal discussion and people don't have to worry about being, uh, 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 being recorded or... or feeling unfree. Uh, now, just as an introduction, as I said, uh, our journal, the Executive Intelligence Review, which this is the latest copy, is a journal that has been also coming out for 38 years now. It has been a journal of the record in, in that period of trying to discuss the real strategic issues uh, going on in the world and give people uh, the opportunity uh, of getting away from uh, the normal uh, manipulation through the media and actually uh, be able to, to begin to, to grasp and to see uh, uh, the more fundamental processes behind uh, the day-to-day -day political uh, effects. Uh, that we see. Uh, key in this is this gentleman, Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, who is uh, actually right now, he's 89 years old. He's been a very uh, a prominent political figure now for, for five decades. Uh, uh, he is still going strong. Uh, thank God for that. Uh, and he was the founder of the Executive Intelligence Review, and he is right now the leader of uh, the La LaRouche Political Action Committee in the United States, and has been running for president, uh, not the last time, but he, he has been running for president before that seven times. Uh, and he is right now a, uh, 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 through LaRouche PAC, a very uh, important uh, strategic factor in, uh, in the situation in the United States. As an, uh, I mean, his role has been for, for decades to warn against the policy that has been uh, mainstream policy in the United States, uh, to warn about uh, again and again uh, the financial breakdown crisis, coming out with regular forecast warning, what is going on right now will lead to a breakdown of the financial structure in this field, will lead to, to this catastrophe. This is what we could do uh, uh, to prevent it, but if that is not done, then this tragedy will happen. And has been, I won't go into that now, we can do that later if necessary, has been, has an impeccable record of actually predicting the major uh, uh, financial changes over the last, uh, last five decades, including the present financial crisis. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is that uh, you can say that he has uh, shown a a uh, very unique power of forecasting, ability to be able to uh, not sit with a crystal ball and predict what's going to happen as some uh, fortune teller, but be able to forecast uh, what will be the result 
of a certain way of thinking, of a certain set of uh, economic policies, what will be the result of this, and look at uh, uh, the events not from the uh, idea of simply sense perception, you have one thing here which will lead to that, but seeing the whole process from the standpoint of what is the overall geometry we're dealing with, what is uh, this, the, the outside bounding strategic factors which determines what is possible or what is not possible within that geometry. And for that reason, he has not only become a very important economic forecaster, but also a strategic forecaster. Uh, I mean, there was many people who, when Lyndon LaRouche, in, for instance, in 1988, as part of his presidential election campaign in the United States, held a speech in Berlin, in West Berlin at the time, in 1988, and predicted the coming breakdown of the the East Bloc system and the possibility of having a reunited Germany with Berlin as its capital. At that time in 1988, people said, that's impossible, that cannot, never happened. Uh, but it did happen very short time after. Not as a simple causal, not as a simple continuation of something that happened before, but as a breakdown of a, of a strategic system which led to a new geometry. And this ability of Mr. LaRouche is extremely important right now because it's, it's this, and, and as I said, we are in times right now, I mean, like we said uh, with the title of the seminar that, uh, and I'll get, go into that, right now, if it is being allowed to continue this process, which started uh, seriously when uh, you had the Libya operation, then it ended with the killing of Gaddafi. And at that time, Mr. LaRouche came out and said, this is a dramatic strategic shift. That means that, that uh, the powers that be have decided to move very quickly from the Libya operation to the next war, and, or the next wars both war against Syria, war against Iran. But that these wars are not local wars. These wars have the same significance and the same strategic place on the map, like the Balkans war had in former times when the Balkans became the uh, uh, the, the a tinderbox which ignited world wars. Because having war against Syria, against Iran at the present time, will automatically include all the strategic players in the world. And uh, therefore, you will, in whatever process we, that can be difficult to predict, what will the different steps be? That's not what LaRue says, this will lead to this, this will lead to that. Many things can happen. But what you do know is you have a geometry where these wars, the way the world looks right now, and I'll get into that, automatically are world wars. And world wars also right now means the very uh, probable use of thermonuclear weapons. So. Uh, so it's a very dramatic time, I'll go into that. But in, under those circumstances, it's the big question is, well, are, are we then, are all the countries of the world cursed to have to go through a thermonuclear world wars because somebody does this and somebody does that and then things naturally escalate 
and that's the way it has to be and nobody can back down because if they did if for instance Russia and China would back down to the United States on these things it would mean that they would lose their sovereignty and it would make them slaves therefore they would have to stand up therefore you would have this escalation if such a process is to be uh, changed it means that you have to look outside the box of simple, normal uh, uh, politics as it's described in the media. You have to move outside sense perception. And you have to begin to reflect over what are the, the, the causes, the unseen causes, which is behind what we can observe and see, which causes these effects we see which causes the shadow we can observe. Uh, what is this hidden geometry? What, uh, uh, and, and from a strategic standpoint, behind the effects we see, behind the moves we see, what is the underlying intention that is driving these processes? Uh, what is the axioms that control different nations, different people? Uh, that leads them to act in a certain way if you tickle them the right way. Like was used, for instance, in the Balkans before. You know, if you did certain things, people would become very agitated. Then they would go to war with each other, and then you could play on that. The same is, is possible in the Middle East today. And uh, 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 by under, understanding these unseen underlying hidden things be able to understanding the process and therefore also intervene into it and being able to actually uh, uh, have a say in what the future will be of your nation and of the world. So I'll get back to that. But so we had this, I mean, this killing of Gaddafi, this very brutal end to the Libya action was immediately followed on by the drumbeat for war, both against Syria, and as you probably all have noticed, I mean, it's like it's a copy-paste cop, uh, copy operation almost. Every single step that was taken in leading up to the war against Libya, all the things said in the media, all the propaganda, we've seen exactly the same thing around Syria. And it's the same thing as that uh, at the same time as you had that build up, you also have this very dramatic propaganda build up around a, a, a report from the International Atomic Energy Agency saying in, in Delphic language, basically saying nothing new, but it was being used in the press media to say uh, there is a threat of Iran getting nuclear weapons. Therefore, action has to be taken. Uh, LaRue said from the beginning of this, he says, what's really going on here? We have a breakdown of the financial system right now. We see it right now, I mean, as, as we sit here now, I guess soon they'll gather for a working dinner down in Brussels where the, uh, the, the, go the uh, governments of the European Union is supposed to somehow find a magical formula to stop this breakdown crisis in the Eurozone and in the whole uh, European financial system. But that's not an isolated European event. That's simply part of a breakdown of the whole global financial system that we've been seeing very dramatically ongoing since 2007, 2008, but which has not been stopped. The Federal Reserve has been printing a hell of a lot of money and putting them out. Put, try, uh, uh, there's been all of kind of bailouts and bailouts and bailouts, but at no point has the underlying reason for that financial breakdown crisis actually been addressed. So it's still there but it's just a lot worse today than it was in 2007, 2008. And a lot of the mechanisms to solve things temporarily by simply putting out money cannot be done within the 
the framework of the present system right now. And that's, of course, what's on the table down in, in Brussels. Uh, are we going to simply hyperinflate the system? Are we going to give the European Central Bank the power to simply print money and buy up whatever uh, 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 state bonds uh, that cannot be sold, whether it be from Spain or from Italy or from whoever? But if that is done, how long will it then take before hyperinflation blows out the whole system? That's the big question. And that's the same question already being raised with the policy from the US right now, what they call quantitative easing number three of the Federal Reserve simply just printing out money. When do you reach the point when money ceases to have any value because you simply printed much too many? And that is the reason also why Germany so vehemently opposes this, because they've been there in 1923. They've been in the situation where they printed money for convenience sometimes, and suddenly in 1923, money ceased to have value and everything blew out. Uh, but so you have a financial breakdown crisis, and it's in the midst of this breakdown of the financial system, La Rousse says La Rousse, that you have to understand what is going on that that's the background for uh, the British and the British sphere of interest saying, OK, let's go for World War now. Let's start the war, these wars, Syria, Iran, whatever else we can throw in the hat, get a strategic confrontation, and get, a, get the United States, China, and Russia to eradicate each other. Uh, to destroy each other, because right now we've seen a process going on over the last decades of a destruction of the U.S. economy. There's not much production in the U.S. There's not much economy left. We've, we're seeing a destruction of the European economy, also with this whole climate policy of, of saying we should no longer have industrial production, nuclear power is forbidden, only windmills and burning wood and primitive technologies should be allowed. Uh, but at the same time as we've seen this, this suicidal destruction of the US and the European economy, we have seen a situation where Asia has continued to progress, where Asia is right now becoming the place in the world where you produce nuclear power plants. China is becoming the place in the world where you have the leading technologies for high-speed trains and probably by now have more high-speed train links in China than the rest of the world together. Where uh, there's a strategic collaboration, increasing strategic collaboration in Asia, also between Russia and China, partly also with India, with other countries. And seen from the powers that be, seen from this collapsing financial empire that is run out of city of London, which still is the same basic system that was set up with the British Empire. It's just been more, it's international, it's private finance, it's the idea that private financial interests should, the markets, should run the world, not nations. You've had this process of globalization where the nations have taken away their uh, protection, so to speak, against the, the, global, the global process and where it's the market running things. Now, seen from, from London and, and, their, and these global private financial interests, the idea is not to have taken down things in Europe and the United States in order for China and Asia and Russia to continue to have scientific and technological progress. Because then Asia will take over the world. They have the people. If right now they have increasingly put the productive apparatus in China, Russia has this a scientific capacity. If nothing is done, then Asia will be the dominant power in the world. 
if Europe and the United States continues to self-destruct. And therefore, says LaRouche, have no illusions. That's what's going on. That's the problem we are talking about, seen from London. They cannot accept Asia and the rest of the world to continue to develop right now. That has to be stopped. And the only way you do that seriously, I mean, it's been done. Right now, they have this uh, COP17 in Durban in South Africa. We had the COP15 here in Copenhagen two years ago. That was the real big attempt to say, can we get the rest of the world to sign on to not having economic development? And the answer was no. They didn't go along with it. Uh, and that brings us where we are today. Throughout this whole process, you have also to look at, again, coming back to behind all of these effects we see, what is the intention behind what is going on? Now, the British Prince Consort here, Prince Philip, uh, has been extremely explicit for a very long time about what he and the British Royal House consider the main issue to be. Namely, that the big problem is population growth. The big problem is we are now 7 billion people in the world. And when he said this quote in 1988, we, I think we were less than 6 billion. Where Prince Philip says, and this is just one, he has said this over and over again, the big problem in the world is population growth. Human population has to be reduced to at least, he said in former times, 2 billion people. Now he has reduced it down to 1 billion people. That's, he says, the carrying capacity of the world. That's where the population has to be, be what it has to be reduced to. People normally don't, when, he, when, when these are the statements from uh, pe pe people like Prince Philip, people then don't ask the, the, the natural question. Well, if the human population should be reduced to under 1 billion people, how is that supposed to happen? How is that going to be enforced? And uh, one has to understand that from the, the, the British elite, but not just from the British elite, but from what can you say, the oligarchical families, the, the, the old, rich, powerful families, which were the powers behind the British Empire, uh, 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 and before that were involved in other empires. Seen from their standpoint, uh, this, there's no way around it. Population growth is uh, a big problem, they say, because population growth needs to pressures on all the system. It need, population growth means that you'll run out of what you can call the natural resources. Therefore, human beings are forced to <coughs> not rely on natural resources, but to develop new resources through scientific and technological progress. That leads to scientific and technological progress, which also leads to people, and that is a natural process. Th they think, <laughs> and they want to have a say in what life is going to be, and what their future is going to be. I mean, you've seen, and from its inception, the United States was represented that principle in a core form that uh, the United States, in the United States, it was created as a nation where people said, we go far away from Europe. We built our own nation far away from the old oligarchical systems of Europe. And as they did that, as a natural part, when, when the British Empire came in and says, you cannot do as you want, 
we want to rule you and decide what you can do. That was what the United States had its revolution against. That was the American Revolution. In the United States, with its constitution, was therefore from the beginning built in that we create our own government. It's a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. We have, therefore, the government's role is to promote the general welfare of the population uh, through scientific and technological progress, through development of the economy, through building of infrastructure like the Transcontinental Railroad. And in that process, you have a nation and a people which automatically is a threat to the system of empire, to the British way of thinking. And therefore, you have to, by all means, destroy that. Uh, and that, like, that hatred of the United States that has always been there from the British, of that principle of the United States, and that, uh, and, and that idea of sovereignty of nations, that hatred is now also becoming the hatred of British and these private financial interests against Russia and against China and against nations in Asia which show national sovereignty and which have decided to develop their nations and develop their peoples. And that's, uh, that's the issue uh, behind the fight uh, that we are standing with right now. Uh, and Mr. Mr. LaRouche, he's in a statement that came out, we also had in the invitation. Right here, when, what is it now, 10 days ago, you had this very mysterious uh, NATO bombing of two uh, Pakistani border posts. And it's very mysterious because you had these Pakistani border posts that were on all the maps and so on, and suddenly uh, 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 they were, came under attack from NATO. Uh, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of the border guards were killed. And of course, Pakistan is in a total revolt against this. What is going on? We're supposedly allied with NATO in this fight, and then they bomb us. What's going on? Uh, and uh, uh, LaRue says, well, you have to understand uh, uh, this. What's going on? Pakistan is part of Asia. <laughs> And that's the issue right now where he, he says, the point is what you're dealing with, the issue is thermonuclear weapons. It's a strategic blast intending to destroy the entirety of everything that's viable in terms of industrial capability and similar capabilities in the entire Asia region. What they're planning to do, which in a sense we were able to, to spoil, I'll get back to that, because some US military took a stand on some of these things. But the intention was to go directly, immediately from coming out of Libya, into a preemptive thermonuclear attack on Asia. And all parts of Asia that have any kind of technology in them are going to get wiped out. Uh, now that was delayed, and it gets complicated, because in the meantime, with the bombs not thrown dead, you have Europe is now disintegrating, because the bailout system in Europe is now disintegrating. But. Uh, uh, but just to I'll recap, I'll get back to that. Uh, this system, I'll just have show some quotes here because uh, on that it is a very when, when LaRouche says, where does thermonuclear weapon come into the picture here? Uh, would you not, if you attack Syria and uh, and Iran, would that really be nuclear weapons? And in terms of Iran. It can be debated whether or not it, it might have to be. Uh, uh, but it's not simply those two countries. It's a whole process. It's a global strategic process ongoing. So I'll ju I just have some, some quotes from, from, from the sum uh, just to, to give a little color to it. This is from China Global Times around November 9th. While the US and other Western countries are struggling economically, their military power reigns supreme. 
This cost contrast is inevitably tempting in their strategic thinking, but would have a profoundly negative impact on world peace. The last few days have seen tensions over Iran take a sharp turn for the worse. Some feel that the US and Israel should combine to strike at Iranian nuclear facilities. This is reminiscent of those who encouraged NATO to hit Syria a few weeks ago. Even with bigger countries like China and Russia, elements in the US have clamored for an attack to eliminate their nuclear power once and for all. Uh, ah, this is the former commander in chief of the US Central Command. He is one voice, but among quite a few uh, US military forces coming out on this issue, where he said here in an interview to the EIR magazine, I'm afraid that this thing, a military strike against Iran, is going to be a fait accompli. It's just going to happen one morning. We're going to wake up and the strike has been conducted. Uh, and the U uh, we spoke to uh, huh? A fait accompli, it means a s s it's done. Okay. It's, it's, it's an ac accomplished fact. Uh, so you wake up in the morning, and without being asked, you're then confronted with a, a reality. But this guy is one of the good guys? Or is he he's, he's a good guy, yeah, because he's coming out warning about this. Uh, another, this is a senior Pentagon source reported to EIR that two top generals had met with President Obama and said, it is the consensus of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, CENTCOM, and all of the other top military brass that the Israelis must be told in absolutely clear terms that any military attack on Iran is thoroughly unacceptable and would likely lead to world war. And I'll just say on that, because uh, we began, La Rouge came out, as I said, right when the murder of Gaddafi, Gaddafi was liquidated, by the way, very directly on Obama's orders. He was the guy who decided Gaddafi should die. Uh, in the end of October, uh, when La Rouge then came out with this very explicit statements saying, this is a threat of World War III, this is what is planned. You have these, you started, you go on to Syria, you go on to Iran, you st start this process which then will unfold, which very quickly can end up being unstoppable. That did have effect in certain places. The most prominent effect of people actually taking action to do something about this was actually in military circles, like in the United States. And we were also told when this happened, this quote that is referred to, that they very directly said to Obama, what, uh, uh, you have to call Israel up and state to Israel that they cannot attack Iran. And if they do so, they will be on their own. And Obama reportedly said, no, I won't do that. If they attack, I would rather prefer not to know in advance. That's, the rumors are that's what he said. Uh, but the fact that the military has taken a very sharp stand on this and a, a united uh, top military command in the United States very explicitly told the president this cannot be allowed to happen is, is quite unusual. And that is also what LaRouche has referred to, has uh, uh, sort of blocked certain things in this whole process. Because if you uh, uh, look at the, uh, at the Israeli government, Netanyahu and Barak has, has both stated that they are ready to attack Iran. Uh, again, in Israel, there's been opposition. There's been a huge debate in, in Israel about this. But a lot of the <coughs> opposition in Israel has been coming from the military, has been coming also from former mili leading military persons, also two former uh, heads of, of Mossad, and so on and so forth. Basically stating what I would call almost stating the obvious, if you do that, if Israel attacks uh, 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 Iran, there's a very big likelihood that that would be the end of Israel. 
There's many ways where you can then discuss how would this go? Would they first attack and, 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 and Iran would attack it back and they would then use nuclear weapons in the second option? Would it be this way? Would it be that way? It's a very, very uh, uh, uncontrollable and un, uh, uh, a process you, uh, that's very difficult to, to, to totally predict. Uh, on the international side, uh, just some statements, and you, of course, can find many others. This is Admiral Valentin uh, Salivanov, uh, retired uh, former Russian commander of the Mediterranean Squadron. And this is also because Russia decided in the, uh, with this whole geared up campaign of war against, potential war against Syria, Russia has moved warships into the Syrian coast to clearly mark that this is unacceptable, that they, uh, that, that uh, this will have severe consequences. Uh, he then says, if somebody's ships are located somewhere, of course it's not possible simply to fly over them and bomb someplace, that is, fly over the Russian ships. Even the Americans will not be able to ignore the arrival of our ships off the coast of Syria. Although probably our only aircraft carrier plus the Chabanenko do not have the ability to stop an entire war. But their appearance in the Eastern Mediterranean will be a signal to the whole world that Russia has its interest here and you, cannot, you can't just crush, destroy and kill everybody without taking them into account. Uh, this is a quote from General uh, Nikolai Makarov, Chief of the General Staff of the Russian Armed Forces from November 17th. I cannot rule out, in certain circumstances, local and regional armed conflicts could grow into a large-scale war, possibly even with nuclear weapons. Russia could be involved in a conflict where weapons of mass destruction could be used. The possibility of local armed conflicts virtually along the entire perimeter of the border has grown dramatically. Uh, then also as, as part of the, what you can see, the strategic response to this reality, uh, the rush and also uh, there has been moves. Uh, 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 Britain and the United States has uh, taken, they have and canceled this uh, agreement on the convention uh, uh, agreement on conventional forces in Europe, where you in advance tell what military moves you, you take. That has been uh, 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 taken out of practice, so Russia would not know what's going on. And other and at the same time, uh, Obama has very explicitly said we intend to go on with this so-called uh, missile shield in Europe which Russia has said, let, if you want a protection against nuclear weapon, let's make something together, where they the very spe specifically has said no. Anyway, uh, Dmitry Medvedev held a, a, a live press conference on Russian television, which then also by the uh, 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 Russian state has been translated into Eng English and posted on their websites and so on and so forth, where among other things says, as a response to these things. First, I'm instructing the Defense Ministry to immediately put the missile attack early warning radar station in Kaliningrad on combat alert. Second, protective coverage of Russia's strategic nuclear weapons will be reinforced as a priority measure under the program to develop our air and space defenses. Third, the new strategic ballistic missiles commissioned by the Strategic Missile Forces and the Navy will be equipped with advanced missile defense penetration systems and the new highly effective warheads. Fourth, I have instructed the armed forces to draw up measures for disabling missile defense system data and guidance systems if need be. These measures will be adequate, effective, and low cost. Fifth, if the above measures prove insufficient, the Russian Federation will deploy modern offensive weapons systems in the west and south of the country, ensuring our ability to take out any part of the US missile defense system in Europe. One step in this process will be to deploy the Iskander missiles in the Kaliningrad region. Uh, so 
uh, and then also just to this part of this picture, uh, the day before, actually, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, who has been very outspoken in this whole process of what's going on in Syria and Iran and so on, said at a press conference, I do not rule out that underlying economic processes are shifting the axis of the global development to another region, namely the Asia-Pacific region, where there are new powerful centers of economic growth with the inclusion of China, India, and Brazil. Probably some people in the West consider this a negative tendency. Uh, and uh, then, just as to round this off, this is from, from uh, China's press agent in Xinhua. Russia has sent its Admiral Kuznetsov, the only aircraft carrier on active duty, and it is now on the way to the burning ocean zone off Syria. This also gives rise to some speculations that the possible encounter be between USS George H.W. Bush and Russia's Admiral Kuznetsov off the Syrian shores could finally ignite the tinderbox threatening the already brittle tranquility in the region. Uh, and to this picture, I will not go through in detail. The latest EIR has much documentation on all these things. You also have to see that it is an extremely dramatic buildup of the US forces, both in the eastern Mediterranean and also off the coast of Iran, with uh, what, uh, aircraft carrier in the eastern Mediterranean, several of them off the coast of Iran, and it's like it's 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 a tremendous military buildup uh, that is part of of of, uh, of the whole thing. Uh, so I just took this up because what you can see, and it's like. For, for many, it's almost, I want to say, it, it's a dramatic, strategic uh, shift that has been going on. And it's going at a, at a very, very rapid pace, uh, uh, where things are being moved forward on all fronts, where this strategic confrontation is, is being uh, 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 is, 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 is more and more dramatic. And Again, where this is going on at a time where you have to see it as, as, a, as part of this dual uh, crisis, where on the one side you have this strategic confrontation building up, but it's happening at the time when you have the whole breakdown of the financial system. Uh, I want, just want to mention, uh, we did this mobilization, others have been out, like the Danish foreign minister actually came out uh, as almost a month ago, as this whole thing began, uh, and said, very, said, I want to as strongly as I can warn against bombing Iran. It will be an extremely dangerous adventure, and Denmark will not participate under any circumstance. A military attack on Iran will unleash a lot of dangerous forces in the Middle East and other parts of the world. Military action against Syria and Iran are dangerous ravings. To get Russia and China to clamp down, they must have a guarantee that an escalation against Iran would not end with a military attack. And he asked, uh, uh, or said, it is unthinkable that Denmark will participate in a war when the justification is manipulated, made up, and it isn't true. But at the same time, you also have to say, he then in the European Union, there's built a build-off build process saying, so in order not to go to war, we have to increase sanctions, we have to do this, we have to do that. Uh, and one then has to reflect that that is part of moving the process forward. So you, uh, you keep moving things, you keep uh, beating uh, the drums for war, and you end up in a situation where then uh, uh, you get a war. Uh, and <laughs> I'll just say, the, uh, of course, 
you then think about this, and 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 it's it's some very, very 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 harsh things. I mean, uh, who could be so insane to propose World War Three? <laughs> uh, uh, that cannot happen. Uh, and you automatically, of course, go into a denial. I don't want to think about that. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I want to go out and do my Christmas shopping and <laughs> and think about some nicer things. Uh, Historically, this has happened again and again. In the Seven Years' War from 1756 to 1763, that was a war where basically it was a world war. It was Spain and Russia and France and everybody was involved. What came out of that, finally, with the Peace of, of, of Paris in 1763, was that through these wars, where everybody fought each other, Britain ended up being a global empire. That's where they got India. That's where they got a lot of Canada and so on and so forth, a lot of these things. The world went to war. The world suffered under war. But the British Empire was built, to a large extent, as a result of that war. The same thing if you go through and look at what happened with World War I. World War I was a tremendous strategic cat catastrophe. And Europe to this present day has still not really uh, come out of the after effects of that war. Uh, Germany was ex terribly exploited. France was terribly exploited, it, it destroyed, and so on and so forth. But while everybody else was killing off each other, Britain expanded their empire. They took over the Middle East. They took over a lot of new territory. So there is this tradition of, uh, again, pitting the others against each other. And this is, again, it's not a new principle. It's divide and rule, uh, uh, divide and conquer, divide and rule. This was the principle of the Roman Empire. This was the principle of empires before. This was, as the, as the Roman Empire continued under the Byzantine Empire, as you had the continuation of the em global empire going into the Venetian Empire with the whole crusade systems, and then the British Empire, all of these empires are, in principle, the same empire that just has moved. It is the same global private financial interests which has moved around, shopping around. Where do we have the place to set up shop from where we can run the world, from where we can make sure that our private financial interest will run the world in our interest, on our behalf, and manipulate the world <clears throat> to prevent sovereign nation states from becoming too powerful and thinking too much on their own interest and the interests of their populations. Uh, and that is uh, uh, where we stand right now. I mean, uh, uh, we, ha we have this threat. It's very real. There is a strategic buildup. Uh, Russia, China cannot sit idle by and simply uh, accept, ah, now the US is taking over uh, Syria and Iran and this and that. This is a building up to a very real strategic confrontation. And once it's built up, uh, 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 you can't simply stop. Now, then the biggest part of this thing, which, which I'll end off with, which is not totally end off with, is the fact, how is it possible for Britain to do this? Well, it's possible for Britain to do this, because you right now have an American president, Barack Obama, who is not really American president, but for all practical purposes, is an agent of these British interests. He does nothing on behalf of the American people. He has up until now been doing everything for the interests of City of London, Wall Street, and all of these circles run out of, of this British Empire model. 
And as Mr. LaRouche has been emphasizing again and again, Barack Obama is not just a president which is not acting on behalf of the US interests and instead of the British interests. He is also in, insane that he suffers the same kind of pers personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, that former, that, that you, if you want to study it, you saw, for instance, in Emperor Nero of the Roman Empire. The same kind of suicidal, self-destructive maniac, which therefore would be fully capable of, uh, 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 on behalf of these British interests, go all the way and just escalate, 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 and not uh, 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 and until you have full-fledged thermonuclear war. And therefore, Mr. LaRouche's uh, point in the US right now has, on international has been, therefore, all sane forces in the world, and especially in the United States, has to work on getting Barack Obama out of office now. He has to be out. You cannot wait until the next election. You cannot hope for a change down the line because things right now is, is moving at an ex accelerating pace and therefore uh, patriotic circles has to intervene. Now, at the same time as we stand with this very, very stark and very, very uh, uh, terrifying perspective of what can happen if, if Obama is not being put under control, if, if patriotic circles are, are not doing what they should do. At the same time as we have this threat, it also is a very unique historical opportunity that comes out of this, because this threat of this nightmare we could go into is a threat against all nations. It's a threat against the United States, it's a threat against Russia, it's a threat against China, but it's a threat against all human beings on this planet. So that means that right now, out of this strategic financial breakdown crisis we see, there should also be the, the, the excitement of all human beings of saying, this is terrible, we will not let this happen. I'll forget about the petty issues now we'll collaborate on the big issues. Now we'll move to really get a, 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 the full humanity collaborating together uh, on creating a, 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 a common future. And it's very, very important in, this, in light of this that at the same, and, and like we have been proposing as the, uh, what you can say, the leading principle of this whole thing, a uh, now says Eurasian land bridge, but a world land bridge, a global uh, infrastructure network that could uh, not just would be transporting things, but uh, development corridors worldwide to really move the, uh, the, the nations of the world and, and create the foundation for feeding the whole world. Now, uh, Prime Minister Putin, soon to be President Putin in Russia and other circles has been very much out promoting this and been saying we should have a tunnel under the Bering Straits. Why do you want a tunnel under the Bering Straits? What do you want to connect? <laughs> well, you connect Russia and the United States and Europe, the Eurasian continent and the American continents. But it's, it's, it's a very direct uh, 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 reach out from Putin again and again of saying we should have a strategic collaboration that should be in the whole that that would be in our common interests. Uh, and LaRouche has been uh, also very emphatically you can read more about it in saying right now we have a global financial breakdown crisis. It cannot be solved within the present system. If nothing done, then the US will go bankrupt, Europe will go bankrupt, chaos and war, it will be terrible. But if the United States does it today, uh, if it moves in a similar way that Franklin D. Roosevelt did in the 30s, of intervening with a Glass-Steagall uh, bank uh, uh, regulation, 
moves in with big infrastructure projects like uh, the North American Water and Power Alliance, huge projects, then the US economy can be uh, revived. And there will be a natural inclination if the United States moves in the Roosevelt di direction of saying, well, we in the US, we reestablish our sovereign economic power, else we can't survive. But others should do the same. Russia still has sovereignty and acts on it. China still has sovereignty and act on it. Well, then let the United States, China, and Russia set up a new system, a new financial system, a new credit system with uh, uh, firm, with, with, with connected uh, 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 exchange, uh, uh, what do you say? Exchange, not flexible exchange rate, but fixed exchange rate system. Uh, like, in, but in a better version than what was after the war. And then we have a strategy for development. And if the United States, Russia, and China does that together, well, India will, of course, join in. Korea will join in. Japan will join in. The Middle East, automatically, everybody will join, even Europe. Now, the other thing that has been, right now, been coming out of Russia is a proposal to say, why don't we, Russia, United States, and everybody else, go together for a strategic defense of the Earth policy? Uh, that, and this is in a principle on two things. I can't go into all details on it. But back in the 1970s, LaRouche became the architect of uh, a policy of building up a system defense system ba based on advanced technologies and new physical principles of rendering nuclear missiles impotent and obsolete, of shoot, being able to shoot down nuclear missiles and take away this threat of thermal, general thermonuclear war. Reagan listened to LaRouche on this. He proposed to the Soviet Union there should be a collaboration on this. But then Andropov and, and others screwed up and said, no, we want to go for our world empire. And it then ended up with the Soviet Union uh, falling apart five years later. Now, this kind of thinking, uh, we should, again, say, we have to render nuclear missiles obsolete. But we also have to do another thing. And this is what's in this proposal from the Russians. We right now have the threat that a lot of, there's a lot of asteroids regularly coming within the vicinity of the Earth. We don't know if at a certain, we don't know when some huge object from outer space is going to hit Earth. But we know that uh, if it happens, uh, it will have catastrophic consequences for all of humanity. That we, therefore, have to prepare for. And how do you prepare for that? Well, you have a collaboration between Russia, United States, China is becoming a space power. Others are coming in. But all of humanity, really, saying, we right now, we defeat this push for, for, for world war. But at the same time as we say, how can we then set up a, 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 build up the world economy. We go with a massive program for space exploration, for beginning to look at what is really out there in space uh, uh, so we can defend ourselves from what may come out there, uh, but also transform uh, 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 the view of ourselves uh, from simply from, from being just man on Earth trying to survive from year to year, from generation to generation, to be mankind in space, to be uh, man as part of the bigger galactic processes. Uh, and doing that, of course, this will also ensure that we, in, 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 in all the future we can foresee, will initiate a series of, of breakthroughs, scientific breakthroughs, technological breakthroughs, which will ensure that we will not uh, uh, end up in this kind of situation once again, where you will have forces 
like the British and their puppet Obama that are so powerful that they could actually threaten uh, the future of, of, of all mankind. So uh, much more could be said, but then there will be no time for discussion. <laughs> So I think I touched on, on, on quite a number of, of, <laughs> of big issues. So we'll turn off this, the camera and the recording, and then uh, I think